All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Chupacabra Tutorials channel. I'm your host, Larry, and we're back today to run you through the entire process of installing DS4 Windows, and then I'm going to walk you through the software to kind of give you a more in-depth look at how everything works and the process of getting your various controllers to hook up to your Windows computer so you can use them if you don't want to buy an Xbox controller. Uh, I'm going to say right now, at the start of this tutorial, if you're curious if you should buy an Xbox controller and it's not a big deal to you, I would recommend doing that because sometimes there's a lot of stuff with this process that can break. And if you're not super tech savvy, it doesn't always work super great to try to figure it out. Okay, so the first thing that you need to do to get DS4 Windows working is you need to download it and the first thing i'll tell you is that there's two versions of the program that you should be aware of this one here at the top by jays to kings is the old version this is i believe the guy that originally made it he like fell off the face of the earth and now ryo chan 7 is the one who is developing the software updating it, making it still work with newer versions of Windows. So we're going to go with the second result, ryochan7 at github.io. I will put this link in the video description so you don't accidentally click the wrong one. When we go click that, it'll take us to the website. They will both look very similar or almost identical. And what this is doing is it's telling you what is DS4 Windows, what does it do? It basically lets you plug in PS4 controllers, PS5 controllers, dual, or the, uh, what is it? The Joy-Cons from the Nintendo Switch and the Switch Pro controller. And it convinces Windows that it's using a Xbox controller, although it can emulate a PlayStation controller as well. And it's got a nice little UI. You can set up a bunch of different key bindings really easily through the interface. You can set up profiles that lets you, when you boot a certain program, your driver will, will set up certain key bindings for your controller. There's a lot of different configuration options. It works for DS4, DualSense, Switch Pro, and Joy-Con, which is the PS4, PS5, and then the Switch controllers, which is kind of nice. And then it requires Windows 10 or newer, Microsoft.NET 5.0 or higher. And then it requires Visual C++, which is usually involved on your computer, but you can install that here. I recommend the 64-bit edition. You shouldn't be running 32-bit. Uh, the Vig M bus driver is required to get this thing to fully work. Some of this stuff is going to be walked you through once you download the actual software. Basically, what you definitely need to make sure that you've got down here under requirements is the .NET 5.0 framework and then the Visual C++ redistributable, which is the 64-bit version is what you want. So let's go download this bad boy. We'll hit the download now button. And then here it's going to take us to another page on GitHub. If you're suddenly being like, whoa, Larry, what's the deal with this GitHub nonsense? GitHub is just a place where people put up their projects for you to download. It's usually a place where a lot of open source software is shared, and it's not really a place you're going to find a lot of really questionable software. So don't don't freak out. But what you want over here is, is there's a few different versions of DS4 for Windows. So what we want is you want the 64-bit edition. If you've got 7-zip, great. Download that. 7-zip is free. Otherwise, grab the regular zip file. Doesn't really matter. They're the exact same. I'm going to grab the regular zip file. And then I'm going to throw this file. Uh, where do I want to put this? I'll put this in my tutorial files. And then we'll do a test DS4 file. And then I'll delete this later. And we'll just save it there, right? So once it's done, you can just go to whatever folder it's in and bring this over here. And we're going to right click this and we're going to tell 
like 7-zip or WinRAR or whatever you got, you want to extract it to a folder of the exact same name just to keep it clean and to not confuse things. Basically, you just want to... There's an option somewhere when you don't have one of these programs that allows you to unzip this program and get it onto the onto your computer without it being compressed in a zip file. I don't remember what it is, so if you need another program, 7-zip is free. So we're going to extract this to a file of the same name. And inside of here is going to be another folder. And inside of that folder is going to be what we want. You can take this folder and you can stick it on your desktop. You can stick it in any old folder you want. Doesn't matter where you put it. The program is going to run out of this folder wherever you put it. You can move it later. You can move it now. Doesn't really matter. If you don't have the .NET framework installed, if you don't have the C++ redistributable installed, this ain't gonna run. You gotta have those first. So, if you've got those installed, and if you need them, let's back up a little bit. If you need them, let's go find them for you so you don't freak out. Let's go get the .NET, and let's get the redistributable. So the .NET... Oh, it just wants to straight up download the redistributable. That's fine. We can do that. So these are basically just frameworks that Microsoft develops and maintains that are like the building blocks of programs. Makes it faster and easier to develop programs without having to develop every single thing from scratch. Um, so once you get these, just run them, stall them. Everyone's happy. Uh, over here, we want the .NET Framework Runtime. We want to run desktop apps, so we want to download the 60-bit or 64-bit version. So we'll click on that, and then it'll download it, run it, install it. Everyone's happy. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've already got them installed. Won't really do much for me, but you just click on them. They'll run. They'll do their thing. Everyone's happy. So right back to the main program. Let's minimize that. So to get this puppy working, you need to double click it. It'll open up a window, a window that shouldn't already be open, but it is because I was playing around with this before I made this video tutorial. So let's open up a fresh one. And so this, what's it gonna do is it's gonna say, hey, where do you want me to save all of your settings and preferences? Do you want me to save them to the same place as every other program on your computer? If the answer is yes, put them in the app data folder. If you want to save them so you can move this folder wherever you want, throw it on a thumb drive, throw it on an external hard drive, throw it on the moon, pull it back from the moon, put it on a new computer, and have your uh, settings move with the folder, put it in your program folder. Up to you. I'm just going to put it in my program folder. Because for the purposes of this tutorial, that's the easiest thing to do. Now normally, when... Normally when you open this program up for the first time, but I clearly have run this on my computer before this because I've made several tutorials. Normally, when you install this, this lovely pop-up window will appear and it'll run you through the additional steps that will be very helpful or required for this program to run properly. And the first one is you need to install the Vigim bus driver and that's just going to help run with the controller mapping and everything. Click on this button, download the driver. Everyone's happy. I've already got it. I don't have to run through this. Because it'll require me to restart my computer and that's going to obviously mess up the recording. So click on that, install it, restart your computer, open DS4 back up. If you can't find this window and you need this still, go back over here. Go to settings inside of DS4. Down here, controller slash driver setup button. Boom. Click on that. It'll open this window back up for you. It's wonderful. So the second step is kind of a holdover from back when this program was made to run on like Windows XP, Windows 7 and all that stuff. Uh, Windows 10 has the Xbox 360 and Xbox One drivers built into the operating system, you can skip step two. 
Because you have to have Windows 10 running to get this to work. I guess technically someone was telling me that this will run on older versions of Windows, but I can't really test that, can't guarantee that. Get Windows 10 or newer. Uh, so after that, you've got two optional steps. You can install the, the hid hide driver. It explains what that is and why it might be useful. And then option number five, or step number five, which is also optional. It's the install faker input driver. Again, this tells you what it does. If you want it, here it is. If not, don't worry about it. Finished. So when that's all done, you'll be presented with this list of controllers and it might be empty. So the next step is, do you have your controller handy? Is it plugged in or connected to your computer? If the answer is no, plug it into your computer. If you want to install it and hook it up with Bluetooth, I have a tutorial for that. I'm not going to cover that in this tutorial. Otherwise, if you have a cable, plug it in. That'll do. I'm going to plug in my PS5 controller because it's literally sitting right next to me. Oh, I suppose it would help if I pressed the start button. That might help. If it says stop at the bottom, that means the program is turned off and it's not running. So hit start. And then when you plug in your controller, it'll be like, oh my gosh, I'm alive. I'm a real boy. And then boom. You can already just start using this program to start playing games, and it's not a big deal. Uh, for 90% of people, this is probably as far as you need to go. It'll pretend that this controller is an Xbox controller. All the games you have on like Steam or you self-install on your computer will be like, cool, it's a controller. Awesome, let's touch things. Uh, if this, If you need to get more fancy than this, I'll walk you through that. So this is my controller. And it's plugged in via USB. And then it doesn't have shared access turned on. The battery's at 100%. I don't have... I can link it to a profile ID if I want. And then over here, it's using the default profile. And then I have the option to edit the current profile or to click a new profile to create a new set of settings. So profiles are just collections of your custom settings for you, this program. You can change the key bindings on this to do whatever you want. And the touchpad also does this. It wigs around and you can pretend it's a touchpad mouse on a laptop. It's kind of fancy. Profiles. This is where you can see the default profile, where you can make a new profile, duplicate the profile, import someone else's profile, share your profile with your friends, rename it, delete it, edit it, all that great stuff right here. Auto profiles. What is this? You can set it up with add programs. You can either add them manually or you can just add all the programs that appear in the start menu. You can set it up so that like when I turn on Blender, it uses this profile instead of the default one because I'm weird and I like to use the touchpad when I make Blender stuff because that's just how I like to roll. This would be better for games, admittedly, than this is a bad example. But like, let's say you open up Fortnite and he uses like, you know, the Fortnite controls and you open up Killing Floor and he uses those. So on and so forth. So you can be like, with Audacity, Controller 1, use default profile, save. Boom, done. You know, that's, that's the whole point of that. Output slots. These are all of the slots for your controllers. You can have like eight of them plugged in at once to one computer or talking to it via Bluetooth. If you find that you want to have them turned on or off, for whatever reason, you can untoggle them here, and then, you know, they, they'll they be deactivated and you won't have to worry about it. Not really sure why you'd need to do that. Maybe you have, like, extra spare controllers plugged in and you're not sure, like, which ones you want to use. That's an option. So that's where you control that. Settings. This is some of the more like nitty gritty settings for specifically this program. You can hide DS4 controller. You can swipe the touchpad to switch profiles. You can run this software at startup because you're like, oh man, I got to have my controller working at all times. The only time I work with my computer is when I'm playing games. That would be a great functionality for you. You can show notifications, all warnings or none. Warnings would be things like 
your controller starting to lag and you might die in your game. So we're going to warn you and be like, whoa, hey, buddy, things are on fire. That sort of stuff. It'll also let you know if there's like an update. Disconnect from BT when stopping. So that's Bluetooth. If you click on this, it'll shut Bluetooth connection off to your controller when you turn off this program. Flash the light bar at high latency. So if your controller starts to lag, the color on it will freak out and start flashing red and be like, oh my God, things are dying. Probably a good idea. That way you don't start lagging and you don't know what's going on. You can start the program minimized, minimize it to the task bar, close, hitting the close button actually just minimizes it instead of closes it entirely. You can enable quick change to auto disable Bluetooth when connecting to USB. This is actually really nice. That way, if you like your controller is dying and you don't want to have to like reset it up when you swap it over, you can enable quick change and it won't explode. That's actually really useful. I didn't realize that was there. So there's like a guy in the comment section that this was like the answer to your question. My bad. Um, icon choice. What icon do you want for DS4? Do you want the rainbowy one? Do you want the white one or the black one or just the default one? App theme. Do you like it white or do you like it dark? Check for updates. Probably a good thing. This way it'll automatically update and download the updates for you so you don't have to redo it yourself and reinstall everything. UDP server. I guess that's for like sharing your controller over the internet. I don't really know how that works. It's not really well documented. If you know how that works and you can link me, please do. Uh, use language pack. If you have more than one language pack for your computer, you can pick one. I'm just going to roll with English because I'm clearly speaking English. Use custom Steam folder. If you want to do that, you can put that here. Custom extension name, you can put that here. And there's some other options here. You can do like a control panel, profile folder, all that stuff right here. And then there's device options. Device options, do you, if you can basically set what controllers are supported and what it'll tell you what controllers are being detected. Logs. It logs the stuff that this program does on your system. If you need to clear it, you can delete everything here. You can export these. Maybe you're trying to contact Ryochan for help and they want your logs to see what's breaking on your program. You can export the logs. It'd be like here. Here's the reason why it's exploding. Probably don't need this, but it's there. It's only going to take up a few kilobytes of data, so I wouldn't really bother deleting it. But if you need it, there you go. So let's go back here and let's go look at profiles. So let's click on this and freak out a little bit. Oh my gosh, Larry, what is, oh my, there's buttons and settings and it's crazy and I'm confused and a, a, a little bit annoyed. I got you fam, don't worry. So if you want to rebind anything on here, click it. It'll pop open this lovely button window. You can tell it what you want that button to be. I'm just going to say, that the X button is going to be the A button. Boom, done. And then the up arrow is going to be the up button. Boom, done. It's that simple. You just click it and then you tell it on this other menu what you want this thing to be. You can rebind it to a keyboard button. You can rebind it to a mouse button. And presumably... That gives you a lot of versatility and what you can do with it. You can also unbind them entirely. So, great. Unfortunately, it doesn't really let you get crazy and like bind it to a virtual reality button. Although most virtual reality software kind of has the whole game controller thing figured out anyway. So you probably don't need to get specific or special with that. So yeah. What did I, I think it was that button that I clicked on. Anywho, the other settings over here are you can change the light bar color to basically whatever you want. If you click on it, it'll bring up a color picker and I can make it like, like an orange. And that'll look really cool once I save that. If I hit save at the top, my color, I mean, you can't see it, but I'm looking at my controller right now and it's like a kind of, burnt yellow color so that's kind of nice what else can i do with this i can set up dead zone support 
and max output and like vertical scale and sensitivity settings for the left stick or down here for the right stick and down here for like the L2 and the R2 buttons. All the buttons have various settings that allow you to do things like compensate for drift. And to do that, let's go over here to the controller readings. And this here, this little window is where if I physically move my whole controller around, there's a gyro in there that detects motion. And you see how there's this red spot around it? That's the dead zone. Anything that happens inside the red zone, we don't talk about it. It's like going to Vegas. Uh, and then after it moves out of that red zone, then it'll properly read and detect the motion and tell the computer about it. So let's say that if we look over here at these other controllers, let's say they're like wigging out, right? And you're not touching them. They're just like going That's stick drift, right? You've heard about that, like the Joy-Con stick drift that everyone talks about in the news from Nintendo. It's a common problem. You beat up your controller, you throw it across the room, you beat up your sibling with it, whatever. It damages the buttons after a while. Just using it does that. So to fix that, we go to axis configuration. And we got this thing called the dead zone. If we click up on the dead zone, boom, the dead zone gets larger. So any of the drift that happens in here, it doesn't get registered by your computer so that you won't just start wandering around when you're not touching the controller. Got it? If you need to, if you see, see this moving and it's getting outside the dead zone when you're not touching it, increase the size of the dead zone until it's not. And then it won't be able to escape. If your dead zone's too big, just make it smaller. It's fine. It starts out at 0 0.08, in case you're curious. So that's how you kind of compensate for stick drift in this. It's kind of handy. You can also increase the sensitivity of it if you're like having mobility problems with your hands and you can't move it a lot. You can increase the sensitivity over here. And if you're curious about, whoa, if you're curious about what these settings are, just hover over them and it'll tell you what they do. It's relatively straightforward, like vertical scale. Actually, does it? Maybe? Well, it tells you a lot of these, but some of these, if you can't figure out what it is, just Google, hey, what is the vertical scale uh, in the axis configuration of a controller? And it'll tell you. This is, most of this sort of settings are not specific to any one brand of controller. These are all pretty uniform and standard. So you got the light bar settings. You can, you can color it by battery so that it'll tell you when your battery's going dead by looking at the color. That's actually kind of nice, I like that. You can also set mode of the color to normal or pass through. You can tell it to flash at a certain percentage and then it'll flash a specific color when it's dying. And then you can also do like a rainbow thing too if you want. I'm not sure why you, where you set that. Uh, over here you've got the touchpad. You can do like the slide, or you can tell it to tap. You can compensate for jitter so that your finger doesn't go, oh my gosh, I'm going crazy. Lower right as a right mouse button. That actually looks kind of nice, actually. Yeah, I could do that. Let's do that. Yeah, that sounds handy. And then over here, we got the gyro. You can just you can set up like a key binding for tilt up, tilt down, tilt left, tilt right. What is that? Oh, it just gives you this whole other thing. OK, that's kind of handy. I like that. I like that a lot. So something that people ask me a lot and I kind of Googled it for like an hour today. Is how do you reduce latency on the controller? And there's two settings that everyone seems to kind of agree on help to fix that. And one of those is it says enable data output to DS4. It says output light bar and rumble data periodically to DS4 gamepad. Untick if the gamepad doesn't support data receiving. Changes to this option takes effect at the gamepad connection time. 
So basically, a lot of people say that enable output data to DS4 lags the controller slightly on some systems. If you're experiencing latency and your controller is flashing red, like, oh my god, I'm dying because it's lagging, untick this. And then the other thing is, if you're using this over a Bluetooth connection and it's lagging, do the Bluetooth pull rate, set it all the way to the fastest, which is max of one millisecond which should help, hopefully, try to fix that. And so, yeah. I've not personally ever had any problems, but if you do, those might help. I don't... Generally, if you're experiencing lag, it might just be your connection to your computer. Try plugging it in. Try changing your USB plug. All of those things might be really helpful. The other thing is, if you want the Bluetooth, make sure your antenna that comes out of the back of your computer that handles your Wi-Fi is in a very easy to see place. It's not blocked by metal. It's not blocked by a wall or the butt of your computer. If you don't, if you have Wi-Fi and you don't have an antenna, you probably should have an antenna. Go find your box and put the antenna on. Uh, sometimes they don't come with them. If not, I don't know. So hopefully that, that helps. You can also test rumble pads in the other section, which is actually kind of handy. You can tell if something's broken in your controller or if it's set up correctly. You can also tell it if you want it to emulate an Xbox controller or a PS4 controller. DualShock 4, just say in your head PS4 controller. You can also turn off disable, or you can also set up to disable virtual controller. A lot of these settings are pretty self-explanatory, and a lot of the other ones will actually have a hover-over explanation as to what they do. So yeah, I mean, most of this is pretty straightforward. Gyro controls, touchpad controls, light bar controls, axis configuration. Most of this stuff, I really doubt you'll have to change ever outside of maybe the key bindings, because a lot of these are just kind of technical settings that if you just roll with the defaults would be just fine. So yeah, that's that. I'm going to hit save on the default profile. You can also create a new one. Let's say new. And then it'll ask me, do you want to use a preset option? Choosing no will cause the profile editor to use an empty gamepad profile. I'm going to say yes. And I want my preset to be gamepad with mouse like joystick. Uh, let's say high precision camera. Let's just say gamepad. I don't, I don't know that we need it to be too fancy. Let's say it emulates a PS4 controller and we'll go with it. And then for color, we'll make this one like a weird pink just so I can tell it apart. And then out of the box, this should be 90% the exact same except for the fact that it's reading as a ps4 controller properly as opposed to an xbox controller and then we can call this whatever we want we can call this ps4 default and then we can hit save you can also go in here and edit this and you can select a different preset to load you can say, I want to try these other ones and then apply and then it'll load those other settings instead. And then you can save it and it'll save over top of whatever the profile was that you were messing with. So you can change all that here. You can get really fine tuned with a lot of the different settings for the controller key bindings and the settings for how sensitive they are in the dead zone. It's kind of nice. I think that about covers it really for most of the features of this software. Uh, the other thing I will probably say is a lot of people will probably use other software that has drivers for PS4 controllers. So let's briefly talk about that. Let's say you're playing a game with PS4 controller support. Don't leave this turned on. It can sometimes interfere with that and break stuff. Turn this off. If you're using Steam, don't use DS4 Windows at the same time. Mostly I say that because Steam has built-in drivers for controllers, so if you want to use the Steam drivers, don't use this at the same time. It can conflict. 
If you're using a game that has built-in support, don't use this. They can conflict. Uh, if this is not really showing your controllers, make sure that it's set to start instead of stop. That tends to help. If you're not seeing your controller, try plugging it and unplugging it a few times. That oftentimes will help to get it to detect. Sometimes it takes a minute. Uh, run this as admin is probably also a really good idea. I don't always remember that because I often just do that automatically. You might need to restart your computer when setting up all these drivers before they properly take effect on your system. Go ahead and try that. You might have to close the software and open it a couple times. If you're having that issue where it's not detecting your .NET framework, download the older version of the .NET framework. Download 5.0.0. There's a guide to do that on the, the channel somewhere with a link in the video description to go right to it and download it. Go find that. That will make sure that it'll properly detect the .NET framework. Sometimes when Windows updates stuff, this breaks. Just download a slightly older version. Everyone's happy. Uh, I think that covers most of it. I'll be showing you guys how to hook up your Nintendo controllers next this week. So stay tuned for that. So that'll be it for this one, ladies and gentlemen. This has been kind of like a walkthrough how to install DS4 Windows and get it set up. Hope you found this helpful. I'll catch you next time. Bye, everybody. Have a good one.